I think um, on, a, on a technical level, as I, as I look back on, on Return of the Sokoka 7, um, we shot it in 16 millimeter and blew it up. When we shot it, uh, we were just making a movie out of the blue. There, was, there really was not anything that was quite yet. Within a year, there was something people were calling an independent film movement. There were independent films. Um, we really didn't know anything about the movie business. I had just started writing, you know, screenplays for Roger Corman. Um, there were maybe three or four little distributors who were starting to get interested in not just distributing foreign movies, but is there is there anything made in the United States? Maybe we'll try that. Um, so. I thought this is going to be a nice experience. I'm going to learn a lot. Maybe we'll get it on PBS or something like that. So it was actually framed for television ratio. And uh, later on, when we blew it up to 35, I, I really couldn't scan side to side because I'd used up all that information. But I, I scanned up and down to you know try to give people headroom or chin room if they needed it in the close-ups. Um, but it's interesting. It's one of those uh, things where I knew I didn't like the way I was shooting it while I was doing it. Uh, given the time, money, and experience we had, we did the best we could. I actually wanted it to look a lot more funky. And what's interesting now is every other cop show kind of looks like what I wanted Return of the Sokoka 7 um, to look like. Um, not the ones where they jerk the camera on purpose, but the ones where you kind of follow the conversation. And it has the feeling of uh, oh, Fred Wiseman or Maisel's Brothers documentary where you're just in the room and these things are happening. Uh, it's a very written movie, the transition 